Hi, I'm Maggie. Hi, I'm Grace, and this is A Very Bookish Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to episode 44 of A Very Bookish Podcast. Today is day one of our Authtober, our month-long author um, feature on in October for A Very Bookish Podcast. We have a very special guest. We have author of Electric Idol, Neon Gods, the Wicked Villain series. We have Katie Robert on today. And when I tell you, we were so excited for this guest. We were fangirling. We have been fangirling for days, weeks now. It is yes. Katie is on today. And how are you, Katie? I am doing super good. I can't believe it's October, essentially. <laughs> yeah. It, September flew by really, really fast. I thought I had so many more weeks left into it. And then I realized, uh, no, September is gone. It's it's gone already. It's October. It's, so. We're in the last Yay, week. October. We're in the last week of September. And it's like, literally, I feel like this, I just started my semester back up at university. And I'm like, oh my God, I go on break in two weeks for like my mid, like my mid semester break. And I'm like, I'm having exams and stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like the year has literally flown by so fast. And it's like, it has is crazy and especially with like you katie you coming out with so many books <laughs> this year yeah wow. i i've been trying to well i've had to slow down because i've been yeah. battling burnout because apparently you can't like write like eight books a year multiple years running it doesn't work out i don't know what yeah. so, right. <laughs> um, so i'm having to slow down and like find a better balance but it's like you know, september is hard for me because i've kids and so they all go back to school and it's like mm -hmm. my youngest is in kindergarten so it's been very emotional for oh. everybody's got a lot of emotions <laughs> and so I'm like maybe in October we'll hit our stride a little bit better like that would be nice I would I would I would love that we'll see what happens but October is my favorite time of year so I'm looking oh, forward oh, to yeah. it no matter what yes Halloween I'm always season. so excited I'm excited for October October is like literally my favorite every time like people put on like oh what's your favorite time of year and I'm like October like it isn't yours that's that spooky season universal. give it to me yeah it's like a universal response october should be your favorite time of the year yes. yeah i look yes. i was looking for halloween decorations like two months ago i was like where's halloween decorations <laughs> like i need the spooky nails i need the spooky makeup like i'm ready to, for, for like I, I get like fake nails from like walmart for like five dollars and they have like the spooky like kiss nails always and i'm like they do not have them this year. I feel betrayed, but I love Halloween. October is amazing. I definitely love it. So um, kind of to get us started, Katie, do you want to like just for viewers or listeners who haven't heard of you before, do you want to kind of give your background in publishing and writing your books for us? Uh, sure. I have been... Oh, I've been writing forever, but I've been published full time since 2012. So I'm coming up on two years next year. Oh God, that's weird. Okay. Can't think about that too hard, but um, I started in category romance, which is not Harlequin, but like Harlequin adjacent mm -hmm. and have run the gamut from like murder mysteries to like mob romance to, and I've kind of found my happy place with like re sexy retellings yeah. that are like dark ish uh so I have my fairy tale retellings in my wicked villain series and I have my Greek retellings in the dark Olympus series which are not accurate retellings please do not yell at me about the, the fact that they're not accurate they're only going to get more wild as the series goes on it's so like make your peace now it's on purpose there's a lot of tragedy in Greek myth and I'm like no like justice for Helen like down with Paris all the fuck boys thumbs down so, so yes, yes it's like my fanfic of greek mythology is like the dark olympus series um so yeah i just write really high heat and i got some interesting stuff come down the pipeline there's gonna be some monster romance which i'm very excited Ooh, about yes i'm so excited I feel for like, your monster yeah i feel like so many people are ready for it i mean we just went through the really seven foot tall blue aliens we're ready for monsters okay like, like, like the minotaur say. milking we we all milked with the minotaurs like <laughs> i love that book that book was so good um it's, it's clearly the next phase is monsters we need it's it it's a market that is waiting to be tapped into yeah. it's, it's there well especially <laughs> yeah, with your so, cover design 
your cover design was amazing. Oh, yeah. It's so self-indulgent. I, cause I, I, a couple, a few months back, well, I guess it's been like six months now. I've been on this epic quest for like monster romance, but I'm looking for a very specific thing. Like it exists, everything mm-hmm. exists, but I like have a spreadsheet and like a friend and I have been reading through and like rating and trying to figure out because it's like, I want full monster, not like dudes with horns or like wings or whatever, like full monster, but I don't want to be totally traumatized. Like, and trying to find those two things, like CM Nacosta does it really well, but I also want like the high heat level. So it's like that trifecta is really like, you'll get two, but not all three. Yeah. Um, and I, I think Tiffany Roberts might have some stuff, but I haven't read right. all her backlist yet. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I want that. I'm going to write that. And also, like, I really miss the, like, 80s, like, Johanna Lindsay clinch covers. And, like, I was like, what if I did a romance novel with, like, a clinch cover with a, with a monster and a lady? And, like, you know, like, the overblown dramaticness of it. And the artist who has done my character art for Dark Olympus was like, yes, I would love to do this for you. And so we worked together and she just like, just, she just like hit it out of the park. Like it is so perfect. Exactly what I hoped it would be, which people are like, he's squatting. I'm like, he's sitting on a rock. You just can't see the rock. Like he's yeah. not just like holding like a power squat, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm really excited. I'm waiting. It's at the cover designer now to get like the overblown like script font stuff. And um, it should be out like next spring sometime. I have to, you know, write it first, but I'm very excited. Oh, that's, that's kind of essential. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. minor details. I don't know. You, you have something. Help, you could just put it, put out the cover. I'm pretty sure so many people would buy it if it was just a print. Like, like anything you put out, people will probably buy. Like, I don't <laughs> But yeah, I, I, it's I have plan it, like because I have to finish my it's a spinoff of my like vampire trilogy so like I I'm writing the third book there and then I'll write it um but yeah it's I'm really excited because it's just like like I said it's self indulgent from beginning to end from cover design to content like I'm just here for it and hopefully other people will enjoy it too but if not I had a good time <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting that you said you wrote you you had the cover first. So is that kind of your process when you write? Is do you get like a cover first and then you write the story, or is it just a mix depending on what you're writing? Um, for my tradi- for my traditional stuff like Dark Olympus, it's they I write the books so far ahead. Like I'm about to start book number four, and like two hasn't even come out yet. Like book mm-hmm. four will be turned in before two comes out. Oh. Wow. Um, but and then like we just saw the cover for number three wicked beauty just Mm -hmm. like released this week but Mm -hmm. i had turned that book's all the way through edits like i'm dealing with like the last stage of edits right now so that one i see the cover last (laughs) like um with my independent stuff like because i write so quickly and like release so quickly upon writing it i like to have the covers lined up so i can go off my schedule and have everything ready to go Mm -hmm. and and this one was like I would like to be inspired by this art. Like I have some not safe for work art of the monster couples yeah. <laughs> or well, the first <laughs> two, um, which is how this started. Like it's, it's, it's a whole thing. So, um, so I was like, I, I would like the actual art art of it. And yeah, so this time the cover's going to be done ahead of time, just so I can publish it as soon as I'm done and like ready to go. Mm, yeah, that's wow. pretty cool. Uh, I have to say, that cover for Wicked Beauty, I have a thing about greens and golds that just kind of like, oh, that just, it. the vibe of that cover alone just made me, like drawing me into it. I loved it so much. I love all the other ones as well, but that green just hit different. Well, and it's because they were doing like A-B testing mm-hmm. with a bunch of different covers. And so I think I saw like six or seven before they actually sent me the final one. <laughs> And I was happy that they picked that one because that was my favorite of the bunch. So, um, but that's the first one that it's like a little more myth-based than actual story-based because like the Apple of Discord like is not actually in my book at all, but Helen's super into gold. So it's kind of like a nod to that while still, yeah, it it turned out so good. They all look so good together. I'm like, I don't know what you're going to do for four, but I am heavily invested. (laughs) Yeah, because that's interesting because I remember Electric Idol was a mirror 
at first. Mm-hmm. The first mm-hmm. time I saw the cover of Electric Idol was Mirror, and I loved that. I love the cover now, but I also loved the Mirror because I was like, reading it now, I totally understood the Mirror. Like, would I tell you, like, I blush thinking about it? I think you know exactly what scene I'm talking about. The Mirror was they, so perfect. <laughs> well, that's so funny with the, like, I, they decided to go in a different the direction that like the heart thing that is now because mm-hmm. they wanted it to be a little more like um minimalist kind of like mm-hmm. like neon gods because that yeah. book has been so well received but the mirror elements actually weren't in the first draft that i turned in my editor came back to me and was like hey like you know there's like like a theme as far as like their like sexual elements really mirror their relationship and push their relationship in the first book like I would like something like special like that in the second book she's like how do you feel about mirror stuff because both Eros and Psyche is like the perception of like Olympus and like how they're perceived versus like reality is like big on for both of them for different reasons and she's like, I feel really strongly about this. So strongly I actually put it on the cover. So like, how do you feel about it? <laughs> and like, I was like, yes, that's perfect. I wish I would have thought of that, but like, yay, go team. <laughs> um, but like, I think the mirror cover, I liked it a lot, but I think it wasn't quite as clean looking mm-hmm. as, yeah. or like that heart. Yeah. You're like, oh, the heart, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I definitely, I definitely love the new cover because it definitely matches the old one of like just the single item and then like a backlit background. But I tell you, when I saw that mirror and then I read it and I was like, oh, ma'am, you really took her advice. Like, yeah. Oh, I got my heart palpitating. Like, I I just <laughs> loved, I love your covers for all of your books because it's like you have your, your traditional publishing and then you have your indie publishing for like The Bastard's Betrayal. Like, how do you pick those covers? Love your- that one. So The Bastard's Betrayal is a second generation mob series, like mm-hmm. just for anybody who doesn't know. And the first series of six books and it's all dudes on the cover and like those covers I love like they're they're very like they just let it speak for themselves like I think they did cover shoots for all of them like they just perfect so but for the second generation I was like okay like the first generation was very patriarchal you know it's mob romance and I was like but Mm -hmm. I want if I'm gonna do second generation like I want it to feel like the same but different and so Mm -hmm. all the at least the first four books because it's all the daughters they're yeah. all women on the covers. And um, so I sent my cover designer. I'm like, I want it to feel like glam and like luxe, but also like kind of dangerous. And like, I just like word vomit at her. And I had sent her three or four stock image examples for each one. And she actually found that one. It was like, how about this? And I was like, ha, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you understood the assignment. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So she did like all four of them are just really like have that feel that they're just very like, lush <laughs> yeah and I feel like a lot of people like you know they have that saying of like oh you know don't judge a book by its cover like no we're we readers are very visual people okay I mean it goes with it we read the pages we're looking at it we like what we see we have to have nice covers and for a lot of authors who have like a kind of insight into like you know little nit- things about their cover designs they're able to like kind of give that essence of what the book actually is. And then you have other books where like the cover has no, nothing compared to what the actual book is about. And finding that balance is like, it's icing. I like, as a reader, I am a God awful cover snob. Like I am mildly ashamed to admit that even if an author that I know is like one of my top three authors puts out a book that the cover is like less than what I personally like, I'll hold off reading the book like a big old dummy. Like I know I'm going to love that book. I love all their stuff, but it's like, I don't like that cover. Um, As an author, like because of the content I write, I try to signal, like throw up signals as much as possible so that readers have some idea of what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of that's content warnings and part of that's a blur, but the cover plays heavily into it. Cause like mm-hmm. you can look at my covers and know that there's like at least dark elements of romance, right. like thanks to 50 shades of gray, like, you know, the object cover is a very specific kind of like umbrella of content. Yeah. And um, yeah. So I, I, I try to be very intentional about that just because I, I don't want to traumatize anyone. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I cause like, you- could you imagine 
any of these books having like you know those cartoonish contemporary covers and being oh like oh my gosh look at this cute cover jumping into A it rom-com. and being, <laughs> it's just like my life my life will never be the same ever ever again like scarred for life you know but yeah those darker covers they kind of they pull you in as well and it's just like I want that I want that. yeah well like like I read or I started reading Den of Vipers because that cover is really good I mean that that book taught me some things about myself um like it turns out I have I like I have a friend that we our id lists like our, our whatever we match up taste wise like almost 100 percent and so every once in a while we'll be like have we gone too far like I text you and be like am I going too far and you never say no and I feel like maybe there's a too far but then I like started reading Den of Vipers and I was like Jenny um I found our line like read this do you think this might be a line and she started reading it and she's like oh I do have lines and I was like high five like good job I was like and it was Diesel Diesel's my line he's too mm. much for me um yeah but like I think I could have probably handled all the other content in it but just like the way that he is is just a little bit too much for me personally as a reader it, it definitely was traumatizing my heroes. it was definitely traumatizing for me because that's like my first like really like really like intro into dark romance was this book and I oh, no. <laughs> I have it now because a follower sent it to me to read to read it now because I was like okay I'm interested in it now because I've read a ton of dark romance and I'm like okay I think I'm ready to like reread it and I'm gonna fully annotate it and like talk to you about it like I'm gonna make content on this but like when I first read that and I was like I was like what am I like I don't care if you read it, but I was like, this is like a line for me. And it's like drawing those boundaries. And I think you really do well with that, with your content warnings and you talking a lot about the triggers that are in your books. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Cause like, I know there are authors who, yes, they say like, yes, there's content warnings in it, but like, I feel like that's becoming normalized. And it's honestly great Mm -hmm. that it's becoming normalized. Cause like, it's something that like not a lot of people would think about outside of like the recommendation world of like, oh, you're just going to buy it. And then mm-hmm. you find something very triggering in it. You're like, why did I buy this book? I wish I had known. So thank you for that. I really appreciated that. I'm just, I'm heavily invested in readers having as good a time as possible. And if that means like, oh, this book's not for me. I don't want to read this. Like that's, or like, I will read this when I feel like at capacity for this or whatever. Like, that's how I prefer, like, I read Glint, Raven Kennedy's oh, yeah. book because of the content warnings, because I was like, I feel like being a little traumatized. And like, that's, but I went in like with the knowledge of, the, mm-hmm. of what the content warnings would be. And I mean, I was a little traumatized, but, um, but like, that's so important for me because I, there are certain books that I see recommended with no, like in a list of like spicy romances with no content warnings mm-hmm. involved. And it's like, I know what's in those books and I would be so upset as a reader if I went in and like went in like without and I I understand this the readers like technically their responsibility but like if I can make it as easy as possible mm-hmm. and that's why I have like on my website it's like tropes tags and content warnings because not all I don't feel like some of the things should be content warnings but it would be good just to like have an idea of what it is and so those go in the tags yeah and I think that's important too because like some of the things that a lot of people may not consider like being enough for a warning may be totally triggering to someone else and like that person may not even realize that that was a trigger that they had you know but and like authors doing their their part by like listing all of them it makes it more easily acceptable for readers who are looking for this it's like for someone picking up a book and then wondering what the age rating is and then they you know look it up online but there's no info like where it you know falls if it's like a new adult or if it's YA or you know those things sometimes books are not known well enough to have enough content enough you know research available for readers and so like any kind of anything that anybody put out there whether it's reviewers authors blogs you know it helps future readers being able to pick up books and being prepared mentally to kind of like whatever is gonna happen to this book I mean you know of course we're we're not gonna spoil the book but you know if we know that things are going down 
I have a hard time with like the content warnings are spoilers argument because usually it's in reference to romance novels and it's like well we know at the end what's going to happen yeah. like <laughs> so therefore it's mm. you know and like and it's okay to put the content warnings in a place where somebody has to like seek them out so they're not just gonna like stumble across them but um yeah it's just like I and I just try to hit the big ones like just the ones mm-hmm. that like are obviously triggering for people so that like they're aware going in that you know if they want to even deal with it and some people don't and that's perfectly okay mm-hmm. I I would rather have people not read my book than read my book and get upset because I like harm them unintentionally yeah yeah that's perfect honestly because <laughs> I know like I I'm still newish to dark romance um in the sense where the books that I'm reading I don't consider them dark romance but apparently they are just because you know they're like mafia books or they're you know they have a little a little action in them and things like that and when people kind of bring up oh these darker romances that have these really heavy themes I'm like whoa that's a little too far on the deep end for me I mean I can float but I rough waters are not for me you know well and like conversely sometimes especially like I saw somebody compare dark romance as like kind of like the meat in the middle between romance and horror because mm-hmm. you get that cathartic emotional like bonkersness of horror with the soft landing of romance yeah. and that made a lot of sense to me because especially in the last like you know two years now sometimes I want to read something that's going to like put me through the ringer as long as I know that we we end up okay but yeah. I go look for those content warnings to know like oh, well, I can handle X, Y, Z, but like, I don't, I don't think I have capacity for like F. So like, let's just not do that. And, Mm -hmm. and the dark romance genre is so wide and very deep, very deep. (laughs) It's like helpful to have those like, you know, flag, um, the flags up red yeah. flags yeah because grace yes. and i thank you <laughs> grace and i are very different when it comes to reading i'm a ve- i'm a i'm a dark romance reader i read penelope douglas i've read den of vipers i i have like a i have a lot of dark romance like mafia i have willow winters i have a lot i read a lot but i also read like a very fluffy you can see like my like contemporary romance shelf up here with all my berkeley books and stuff but i think i definitely think that like that's one of the things that I learned off of TikTok is being able to like, it's okay to have a threshold of like, I don't want to go past this. And I think that's, I think it's sometimes like uh, frowned upon in the internet world where it's like, oh, you didn't like this book. Like, and it's like, well, it's just not my cup of tea. And it's this like common thing of like, oh, well then you, you're wrong kind of thing. And this kind of leads into my question of have you, how do you kind of like deal with, have you ever had like pushback when it comes to writing these darker romances and like, how did you deal with that? Um, so I had some pushback from specifically in my own Mally series, which is mob romance, which is not, I, I don't know like I don't know where like because I write like I call it like dark light romance because Mm -hmm. it's like shallow into the pool you'll get a little bit of like bonkersness some light murder maybe uh you know some kinky stuff but it's not we're we're not going off the deep end with most of my books but in the O'Malley's like the last book is the villain of the series up to that point and people were really mad about it because they're like he did this and he did that and some of the stuff they were accusing him of I'm like no he actually didn't like if you like he was he was involved but he he was which in hindsight I would have done things a little differently to make it more clear but um but there's definitely like you run up against a lot of like there's a lot of the talking points about dark romance have been applied to me of like well it's abusive or it's glorifying abuse or it's you know think of the survivors or people aren't going to be able to tell the difference between reality and fiction. And you're saying that this is a thing that you like advocate for in real life. And it's like, well, no, no to all of the above. (laughs) It's fiction, sweetie. It's fiction. And that's why content warnings, because then you can like, I think that. And my views on this have changed over the last couple of years, just because I used to be a little more stringent on like, this is not okay. And this is okay. And these days, as long as it's not actively harmful, and because you know there are books that are actively harmful to like people 
as long as you are flagging the stuff you need to flag and there's consent between the reader and the book like go off like read what you want to read I just I have a problem with people being like you shouldn't read this because of why or like you didn't like this so this means like they're making assumptions one way or another and it's just like it it goes on both ends of that like you didn't like this or you think this isn't it's just like just let people enjoy things yeah (laughs) and and sometimes you're enjoying things that are problematic while being an adult with a fully developed brain that's like yes this is problematic I don't want this in real life I want the cathartic release the same way that I read like horror novels um of like I want to be scared or to be on edge or to feel these heightened emotions in a fictional safe environment that has no bearing on reality and and then I want to close my book and put it down and go live like my life yeah and it's like I think that there's you don't find these conversations in stuff like horror or Mm -hmm. thrillers or literary fiction with like the professors and their young co-eds like they they, you know there's 45 millions of those books or fantasy so it's just or yeah fantasy dark fantasy as well there's a whole genre of dark fantasy as well that doesn't get the same amount of critique as romance does and I think it has to do I'm kind of gonna go off here but like the misogyny that comes with romance and the fact that it's women it's like oh you're a woman you like you're romanticizing this like you you can't decide between fiction and reality like you're reading this this is what you want in life and it's like no like it's a very like cathartic thing how you were saying and it's like it's like just let people live like could I just live in my peace like if I want to read smut to 3 a.m in the middle of my bedroom and it's like like I'm not bothering you just leave me alone (laughs) like well it's just it gets it's it's really fast like I've stopped arguing with people who are never going to read romance about like their perception of romance because I'm like you're not my people goodbye Mm -hmm. but it is blows my mind the backflips people will do to clutch their pearls like um Beverly Jenkins is a historical author and she posted like on National Pirate Day or whatever like one of her old school like sexy clench covers and there was this dude in her comments saying like this is people are going to look at this and think that like sexual aggression is okay and blah 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 blah. and it's like listen you need to leave Miss Bev alone she does not have time for this nonsense and then he and then and then he's like well you can send me your book and I'll read it and then I'll let you know what I think and she's like no <laughs> he was trying to cop like, a free copy that's what he was trying to do right? it's just it's like the backflips of like think of the children or think of the this or people are going to use this as an instruction manual and it's like i i think that it's partly like misogyny for sure but it's also just like this is one of the like the idea of love and a loving like healthy relationship or not healthy, you know, whatever, but like the idea of like, um, like the emotion based in an emotion that's a little less socially acceptable than like fear or like, you know, the uh, angst, sadness, like love is weirdly taboo. Like you you see it in the movies, like we don't see a ton of love stories in like the big, like blockbuster films and stuff. Like there hasn't been one in the Marvel ones, I don't think. And Mm -hmm. it's just like, it's like weirdly taboo. And that just kind of bleeds over to romance as a whole. And it's just like, oh, tee these people with their bodice rippers. And it's like, I would love to bring the bodice ripper back, I mean... but also. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 and I like how TikTok, like uh, this smut talk community is what I'm going to call mm-hmm. it, has really like pushed this boundary. And it's like, no. And like, and what I love about TikTok is how you can, how I've seen more men reading, like I have like three guys I know that read Penelope Douglas and that have read Neon Gods and that have read all of these like popular like smut talk books and they're like, I love this. And I'm like, it, it warms my heart because it's like, oh, like you get what like we like, it's not what we want, but it's like, it's something that we enjoy and it's like, you get it. Like it's just fiction and it's like everybody can enjoy it. And it's, it's really great. I do. I love the romance community now that I've joined it. Yeah. I mean, it's like any community we have our ups and downs and like weird infighting as you know, you know, yeah. like any community, but it's definitely like, it feels really good to find your people like to be like, we enjoy the same things. And we like, and like the, when you find people that can give you trusted book recs, like that's like worth its weight in gold. Like there are certain people that they're like, read this book. And I'm like, I already bought it because you just talked yeah. about it. So like, <laughs> we don't have to talk about it. I'm just going to read it. Yeah. 
And then like you find out like if you end up giving somebody a book recommendation and they have that relationship with you with a, they'll just take anything that you say. It's like the best feeling ever because it's just like, you, you listen to me, you care. It's like the best feeling in the world. And then like you have somebody else that you can talk about this book with that you absolutely love. And it's like one of like the greatest feelings of like being able to connect with people. And, you know, through this whole pandemic that we just passed, like being locked up, but then having act access to so many people through our phone, through our fingertips and building a community where people are across the country or in different countries. And we all connected over this one book or over this one fan art that we see you know and it's like it's pretty amazing and like we've said it multiple times on this podcast that we're like so grateful for like you know everything that has happened because it opened up a world that people weren't aware that was there like a lot of people are not aware that this huge community of readers exist and that in the big whole world of readers there's so many subgenres and so many groups that, you know, people connect with. And then you have authors like yourself who can like jump between all these different genres and touch so many different types of people. And I just think that it's like one of the most beautiful things in the world ever. So yeah. <laughs> when TikTok's so cool because like it feels, and this is going to age me, but like back in like 2011, 2012, yeah. when like Fifty Shades was hitting. People were picking up books for the first time since high school or whatever because it to read for pleasure and realizing that oh, I can read for pleasure. I can enjoy this, mm -hmm. and it feels very similar on TikTok. And that it's not necessarily it's people picking up books for the first time because they had a little more downtime because of you know yeah the pandemic. But it's also people coming from like YA and realizing that that thing that they're that they really enjoy, like some of the elements they enjoy about YA books there's a whole adult genre for it with exactly. like the spice that they're looking for and and just seeing that sort of like happen in real time has been like yeah. magical and I like I can never I try to guess what books people will like the book talk will find next and I haven't been right once but <laughs> but it's really awesome to see like I I was like yeah there's a straight line from like Sarah J Moss to Ice Planet Barbarians and somebody's like no there's not and I was like no I can tell you exactly how they there got is. there because it like it makes sense yeah. and like and it's just uh it's really cool to see like I I love seeing people be like you know I haven't read a book since whatever or I didn't realize that I can enjoy reading like the way that I'm enjoying it right now and I just read 20 books in a week or like whatever it's like you are so powerful <laughs> yes you yeah. kind of scare me but yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um I'm gonna start on my list of questions that I have because these are some of my like yes. questions that like we I created like a, I was like okay we have to have a google doc to like create questions that we're gonna talk about um so my first yeah. question that I've been wanting to ask you because you talked already about like you can't push out eight books a year that's like physically impossible so how do you balance the multiple stories that you're writing and like are there times where you're like writing and you've written about characters from another book that you put into the book because I feel like that would happen I so I am nearly 100% sure that I'm ADD or ADHD like I'm pursuing a diagnosis right now so like I get really bored easily and so mm -hmm. I can't write too many books in the same series in a row like my caps too mm -hmm. and that's actually what happened earlier this series is I wrote too many menages in a row and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and then it turned out it was really actually just full on burnout, but that's okay. <laughs> but it's, I actually like, cause they feel so I'm a character writer. And so the characters yeah. feel so real and unique to me that I don't overlap like that. But I, the thing that I have run into is that I've been writing first person present for so long that like the, mm -hmm. um, the bastards betrayals third person and jumping back and forth from there has been really weird because it's like first it's like third pass and so yeah. I have to like I'll find that I wrote like a half a chapter in first person past tense and I'm like whoa um so that that trips me up like semi-regularly but yeah no it's each book feels so unique that it's like like I can occasionally double draft like do two at the same time or not like you know like I separate but um and they still just feel unique in a way that like I don't 
overlap quite that hard mm-hmm. but but yeah the pace has definitely been like I work more when I'm stressed and it, I had all three children at home with me like teenagers and the little guy and the only place in my house that like they would sort of leave me alone was my office and so I was like well I'm in my office I might as well work and like I'm stressed and I'm not processing my feelings so I'm just gonna write a book instead and so that's kind of where that pacing came from in the last like two years but it's it's not sustainable so when people are like how'd you do it I want to do it I'm like oh you just sacrifice all of your self-care <laughs> like <laughs> That's, don't recommend it's pretty simple yeah. It's just, yeah you know that's just, just so suffer. crazy so <laughs> how long does it not not anymore because we don't want you to burn out but like during these last two years that you've been pointing out how long would it take you to write a book um between because like the, you know the, the length is very like neon gods is like the upper sk- end it's like a hundred thousand words and like mm-hmm. my taboo series is like thirty five thousand. So like between two and eight weeks, give or take, I wrote your dad will do in six days. Don't recommend that. But it was just like this crazy, I was a little stressed and, and it just sort of flowed. Um, But yeah, usually like you, like four to eight weeks is more closer to that. Like, like the average. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I, I, I write really fast, but I write every, like every day. So it like mm-hmm. seems like a lot of words, but when you write 2000 words a day, almost every day of the year, that adds up to a ton of words. So yeah. okay, that's still very um, impressive. That is <laughs> that kind of like leaves space for one of my questions. Um, it's, did you have like early on before like you were writing full time and that was like your thing did you have that like wow I I could definitely be a writer or I see myself being a writer like when you were younger or did it take like a a school assignment that you did a short story like what kind of triggered that like glimpse into your future I I was essentially writing fanfic without realizing it was fanfic, which I kind of wish I'd cl- plugged into that community at an early age because that would have been great at, in like junior high. Um, and like, it wasn't until like my late, te- so I got married super early and I ended up in like Germany with two small children under two and like was going absolutely crazy right as Eclipse stephanie meyer's eclipse was coming out and there was this kind of like that element of like this was her first book and that's so magical and look how well it's doing and those books are so cracky that like in hindsight i can be like well yeah obviously there's problems with them but like i inhaled three books in like three days those books are fat and i was like well she did it maybe i could do it and that could be something for me like again Mm self-care and so then i started pursuing publication like writing and and I wrote the way that I do now and that like it's like write all the way through and then sort of edit and then like hope for the best and so it took me like eight books to get published and there was a divorce in the middle of that and like it was a couple years later um but yeah I I mean I've always written and I've always been super into like fairy tales and books and stories and um and like how a story is like put together but it wasn't until Twilight that I was like oh like yeah. well she could do this maybe I could do this <laughs> yeah and you know it took me a while but I got there eventually that it's it's so funny that like I, I swear the effect that Twilight had on like so many different generations and like it's still you know something that people like go back to well like well when Twilight was around and so many things started at that time Twilight was actually the first book I ever ever read purely on my own like I decided to pick it up and that was it it's it's crazy because like these girls were talking about it and they had like this journal that they would um trade off to each other like every other day and they would write about it and talk about it. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I want that. What are they talking about? They were talking about Twilight. I picked it up. I read it. And I've told this story so many times, but it's my favorite story. Is that like when I finished the first book, I was in my room and I finished it. And I ran out of my room to the living room with my dad and a few of his friends and my mom, my brothers. And I 
I had it in my hand like this and I was like I finished it I finished a book I finished it and I started crying and and my dad just kind of looks at me and just like okay that's good but it's such a transformative like or or transformative god wow words are super (laughs) cool um experience like you see that like like you can see those touchstones like Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey and Sarah J Moss like for better or worse like we can argue and should argue and Mm -hmm. have conversations about the content but the fact that those books created a gateway for readers to get into and find all the other books that exist is like so powerful really is and you know that may have been like you know the starting point and with all of its problems that it has all of these different types of books but then out of that so many writers have been born and so many writers have we were just like I remember writing this book or I remember looking back at it and reading Twilight and being like that was so cool and then they can make something better and they can make something that is more inclusive that is you know more acceptable and has all of like you know the right things needed that weren't fixed in Twilight in Fifty Shades of Grey and you know all these other books is and that's what kind of what we're getting now we're now we're getting a lot of books with more like completely diverse like you want any type of book out there you can literally find it we have so many different books with plc with lgbtq with disability rep and all these different types of diversity now because so many readers grew up with books that weren't inclusive to them yep. but now we're having it and you know it's only getting bigger and the demand is even growing more because you know readers like like us we're demanding it and that's what we want and now publishers are starting to listen and starting to like you know take that into effect and so like twilight for all of its you know so many people can say so many things but the effect was so big and that's what like I think it's really important just, and this is, you know, in hindsight, like I, I definitely got a caught up in the, like blah, about both Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey, but like in hindsight, it's like that was so, and have, even just bringing people back to reading and now mm-hmm. a huge number of my readers came back to reading with Fifty Shades of Grey and now read, you know, eight, 10, 30 books a month. And it's mm-hmm. like, and they're reading more widely and reading with like great consent and great representation Mm -hmm. and like all this stuff and it's just it's so cool to see like that love of reading ignite even if it the property that it ignited with you're like well that has problems well like yeah but like but now look where we're at like it's it's opened these doors for better or worse and like you know there's so much other stuff has followed it's the recognition of that problem that that's what that's what it's allowed for it's allowed for us to look at that and be like hey this is not what we want. It allows for us to be better and for authors and readers to do better themselves and to be like, no, this isn't right. And this isn't what we want. We want bet like we want that representation. We don't want, I'm not going to get into specifics, but we don't want X, Y, Z. Right, we, yeah. we need ABC. So it's just kind of, it's kind of like the great power that does come, especially with social media and like talking about this yeah. with people, especially mm-hmm. Cause like if, if when especially know. with like uh book talk in particular mm-hmm. publishers and they 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 publishers are like your like archaic granddad that's like shaking his fist at a cloud and doesn't understand how technology works like they move so slow yeah. like with keeping up with the times but even they have finally acknowledged that like book talk is really powerful in that how it can like the readers there are buying and they're buying in print which is like worth its weight in gold for like traditional publishing yeah and and they're being like wow I read this book and I liked this book but I was unhappy with like these elements of this book but so I want to read something like this but with the elements that that I want in you know included Mm -hmm. in it and it's like buy these books publisher I want to read them (laughs) like yeah so it's it's you know they're finally starting to take notice like we saw with um Ice Plant Barbarians like they bought I'm not really sure. I think they bought print versions of her, like the first book or two. It's so pretty. And it's like, it's so pretty. It looks so good. So I was good. like, this is the animated cover that I want in my life. Like, <laughs> um, you know, I yeah, already so pre-ordered I think that. that. We'll see more of that. Of course. <laughs> Definitely pre-ordered So many people that. did, I guarantee you. Like, it feels like a collector's edition. It like, is. Yes. It's oh the, the old covers are iconic, but it's like, it's that new age of like, 
the cartoon covers of like that blocked color kind of were all and almost like every single new like rom-com that's coming out is like this like blocked cover but like the way they did it it just looks so good and it's just like it's that monster like style like taking like a monster romance and like putting it into like a style of like a contemporary book or like something that like is deemed as like a normal book in romance and it's like no. oh no this is some this is some very spicy this is this is the you got aliens you got barbs you got <laughs> the rivages <Yes. laughs> have you guys have you guys seen that last episode of what if no no oh, oh i know it's the loki one it's the one where loki yeah i've seen all the photos oh online. yeah i've seen like somebody <laughs> did the size difference and like I was like, you understood the assignment. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> I was like, who over there at Marvel Red Ice Planet of Barbarians and knew? They were really, they understood the assignment when it came to book talk. They were like, here you go. I looked at all. Do you think that like, well, cause like, but those books have been around forever. There's like 27 of them or something. Like yeah. there's, they've been, did they precede the first oh. movie? Probably. They must have. They've been around for quite some time. Let me look it up. I can, I so, can, uh, yeah. I can look this up. I mean, not that like, like the, the ice giants is part of mythology. So it's been around forever. So yeah. like, it's not, you know, but I, I'm always very curious to see influences on like, cause you know, I have them in my books and like others do as well. And like, if Sarah J Moss did not read Anne Bishop's Black Jewels trilogy, because Cassian is like Lucifer in a different font. And I like, even like the way that the, Illyrian, Illyrian, Illyrians, yeah. yeah, like they they're even sound kind of similar. That I'm like, did and yeah. I don't know if anybody else would have noticed this, but like, so, I wonder. I just looked it up. Ice Planet Barbarians came out in 2015. The first book was 2015. Thor was 2011. But like, still to think about like that but many still, books, yeah. that many books in like seven that's, years, almost like that's a lot. Holy cow. Ruby it's... Dixon is like, and that's and that's not the only series she writes. Like she just yeah. writes like she's running out of time. <laughs> like I, I have so much respect. Like, and they're yeah. just they just hit the spot in such a like she balances the relationship mm-hmm. and like the softness with the sexiness with like you know the mm-hmm. world building stuff like so well. Sci fi, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I I definitely could only read like the first. I, I, I'm also, I have a very short attention span when it comes to book series. So like, it has to be like a, f- a three to four book series. And then like, I have to move on to the next series or something like that, where it's like, or if there's like a spinoff, I can go read another series and then go to the spinoff series. But it's like, I cannot commit to 20 plus books right now. <laughs> like I tried to read J.R. Ward. I ended at eight. Like I could not read past eight. Like which it's- one's eight? Is that Revenge? uh no it's john matthew's book oh okay yeah i see i've read those books as they came out mm-hmm. but i stopped at revenge's book i don't remember yeah. why john i Matthews feel like i was yeah. okay okay yeah yes like yeah that's yeah, a long i just it's a long series like i can do I... two books <laughs> see, <laughs> maybe three I'm, I'm a little i i can go a little bit farther with that because i like um I like connected storylines. I like the world. I like all of that stuff. It's definitely like a thing that I look for. Um, so I just finished Sophie Lark's uh, Brutal Birthright series and that's like six books. And I read all six like within a week and which is like insane that's, like, crazy because I her. usually, I do four, three to four books a month. And I read six of those in a week because I could not stop. And I what loved it. What is the series called? I, I <laughs> it's, called uh, it's called Brutal Birthright um, by Sophie Lark. She also has a second gen, which is called the Kingmaker series. It is very cool. It's a mafia um, kind of series. And the plot really was the main thing. Every book was like, that's what kind of kept me and was able to hook me is that each book was the plot was directly influenced by the book that preceded it Mm -hmm. so it's like one of those series where like what happens before you have to know what happens before you can't just pick whichever book even though they're standalones 
each book is directly influenced they by the build on it yeah. yeah so I love books like that I love second generation so I was I pre-ordered Bastard's Betrayal and I was like oh great this sounds amazing and then I found out it's a second gen and I'm just like oh I have to start at the beginning it's it's a thing I have to start at the beginning I love series that do that and so when well, like people ask me if you can start up the bastard trail and absolutely it's 30 yeah. years after the fact don't ask me why the technology hasn't changed don't ask me about the like the greater world we're not talking about it it's fine they live in a bubble it's cool um but like it definitely there are nods and stuff to the originals that are like i put in there for people who have you know because it's a yeah. second gen series yeah but um but yeah i i don't know i just the o'malley's is really special to me because up until that point I had worked with people that told me no all the time. Mm. And so I had just gotten an agent and I was like, I want to write a mob romance. And she's like, well, they don't really sell. And I don't really like them, but like, send me your pages. Like, cause she never tells me no. She just says like, here's the things we'll be challenging about this, but like, let's do it if you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I sent her the first like couple chapters and like the heroine shoots her fiance and kills him in the first chapter of the marriage contract. And I was like, she'll tell me no like somebody's gonna tell me no that like you can't just have a heroine kill somebody like that's not allowed because this was like 2014 yeah. so you know yeah and and then she's like I love this let's go on submission and we went on submission and like I was like somebody is gonna tell me no they're gonna tell me absolutely not this book will never sell it'll never be a thing and like I end up with multiple offers on that book and it's just like wow. every step of the way in that series was me kind of trying to like like that series walked so that like neon gods and like wicked villains could run is like my editor again never she's like oh well um he's torturing this guy in the basement like and it, he like chopped off his fingers could he maybe just break his fingers and I was like oh no he broke his fingers I just didn't make it clear and it's like there was never any like no you can't do this it was like maybe like maybe, scale back this yeah. tiny little thing but like yeah. you can keep all that it's just it was very freeing for me like creatively to like be like oh I can do this and people yeah. like this mm -hmm. that's and amazing. I like this <laughs> that's that's and crazy then, finding someone who kind of like helps encourage that although albeit not completely but you know well I mean she, she her job was to make it as commercial as possible exactly. which you know fair but yeah. but but they didn't make me take the murder out of it it's just like <laughs> like it was it's just hilarious because i like i said i've had an editor that's like you can't do this this is going to make them unlikable this is not heroic this is not whatever and in and part of that's category romance the confines are a lot more strict yeah. but just being like oh i can do that and then when i went indie publishing it was like nobody's there to tell me no mm. like which i have people I, I have to talk i check in with my people because i'm like did i go too far is this too much is this crossing the line right I haven't found it yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's uh, yeah. Funny. So that kind of like how, when did you write Neon Gods then? Because Neon Gods came out this year. So when did yeah, you write so it? Neon, I wrote it, I turned it, I wrote it like a year before it came out approximately. Okay. Okay. Um, but that, my editor has been so amazing. Like she's just like, carte blanche, do what you want. Like, and then I'm going to make it better. Like, because I, I have, I'm not great with world building. So like I add 20 to 30,000 words. So I add like 25% of the book every time I do edits because uh, yeah, yeah. I have to flush stuff out. Cause I'm like, oh, you know, there's a building, whatever. And she's like, what's the building like? <laughs> it, can you give us a little bit of like setting? Like they're in a room, what's the room look like? I'm like, does it matter? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> which in, in the third book, it was like, wow, the relationship's really great. There's no plot. And I'm like, oh. I, I'll put a plot in there. My bad. <laughs> um, but like she, when I went to her and I was like, look, like, cause originally the third book was supposed to be Achilles and Helen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I feel like if I don't have patrol close involved and I don't want him to be like dead. Cause then you're like burying your gaze. And like, that feels bad. I don't want that. I was like, can I do a menage? Like, am I allowed to do that in traditional? Cause I know I do it like indie and she's like, yeah, let's do it. And I had been told no previously with other publishers because you know it's part of it's the way the books are marketed they're marketed as dark erotic romance right. and so it gives me a little more freedom but yeah and then she's the one that because I way back when I first pitched the series Orpheus and Eurydice was supposed to be the third book like a reunited lovers mm -hmm. and she's like yeah like I don't know about that I don't know if it feels iconic enough and I was like yeah no that's fair like you know 
And I'd just been like spatting off on Twitter as one does and been like, yeah, you know, Eurydice and Charon, like, let me pitch this to you, random universe people. And then she emailed me and she's like, okay, but hear me out. Eurydice, Charon, and Orpheus. And I was like, yes. <laughs> well, the book's not contracted yet, but it's, you know, it's, it's planned. Oh my gosh. Well, so That's you awesome. have nine books planned in the Dark Olympus series, right? That's the last time I checked. Like, yeah, it, it's <laughs> like I had, so in a lot of these long running series that we were mm-hmm. talking about, like you can tell where the author had planned to and then the series mm-hmm. took off and then there's mm-hmm. a couple book leg while they try to figure out their feet again and then it takes off again, it's fine. But I didn't want a leg, you know, in the best case scenario that the series took off because like I hoped it would, but like you just don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I had sketched out three arcs just to kind of like keep in mind for me so that like the tension will continue to rise through the series like mm-hmm. externally um but now like there's characters I didn't really plan on and now I'm like I don't know what's gonna happen I I know what my plans were I don't know where we're gonna end up but yeah. like yeah. even nine books is really long yeah. for traditional so like who knows like, it'll depend I, on, you know, readers. there's definitely some characters that I read in in Electric Idol and I was like I'm in love with her I need to like I need to have like my I need to have my book with her like I want to marry this woman like I need her like where is she <laughs> I can't wait to read more yeah. about her <laughs> so I, yeah, I I unapologetically sequel bait like really bad with I'm like let me convince you that you want this series even though that book's like six books down the road or whatever um which you know my editor is like yes let's let's make this work because I want to read all these books I'm like cool I want to write all these books so like <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. It's we'll perfect. see how it goes. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, so I, I kind of, I have a kind of a question kind of going into that. Since your Dark Olympus is like mostly retellings, but kind of in your own way, how do you kind of balance, I guess the Dark Olympus series, there are retellings, but they're very, very loose. And I kind of, how do you balance that line between retelling but then making it completely your own, but then still having those little nods that kind of keep it to that retelling umbrella. Uh, So I like, I mean, the first two books were easier because Hades and Persephone and Psyche and Eros have like the equivalent of like a happy ending at the end of their stories, more Mm -hmm. or less, like depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Um, So the beats are not dissimilar to a normal romance novel beats. Like, and Mm -hmm. But it's also like, I, I kind of be like, okay, here's these, you know, caricature um, characters, you know, the type, like you have the Eros, who's just like the, he's a monster in that, in that original story. Like he is, like he's supposed to make her fall in love with a monster. And to me, I think that making people fall in love, like unconsent non-consensually is like the most horrifying power a person could have so it was very natural to be like oh of course he murders people like yeah um so it's just kind of taking like the things I love about the original stories and using that to inspire how I would like it to go and then being like okay well I know where I want to end up in this romance novel like where can I put nods in so that people who actually are familiar with the myths can be like haha I see that um like the third one's people are just gonna have to make their peace like it's not the trojan war it's not like there's no war um it's but it is like it's like very tournament arena stuff Mm -hmm. and it's not only the iliad that i'm making nods to obviously and right yeah it's it's just people are already so upset that it's helen and not uh what's her face i'm like listen (laughs) helen deserves better condense where i can (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I I have a chip in my shoulder the size of Texas about Paris and so like I it was always going to be Helen it was just a matter of how I wanted that story told and I like Achilles like the big himbo energy mm, uh, yeah gotta love and, the himbos yeah he's just like 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 there's he's just like a cocky ass and not like he's not an asshole he's just like an ass it's just like yeah, yeah I'm the best and and it's just like I love <laughs> that kind of character because then you can like cut him off at the knees <laughs> yeah that's yeah. definitely going to be my favorite yeah I already know clearly with the cover 
and then who it was about I was already like yes this is yeah. specifically for me Katie <laughs> wrote this specifically for Grace right there it was, it was 100% <laughs> I feel like the people who like can appreciate the differences the choice the artistic yeah. choices I made are going to be really happy with the book the ones that are expecting you know the song of Achilles I'm like listen patrol question Achilles died I don't I'm not in yeah. the business of tragedies my friends and so it's it was never going to be accurate <laughs> uh, that's definitely like the hardest part I love Greek mythology like anybody who has grown up with that phase in their life you know we all went through it we all kind of have like this like oh we like it right but so much tragedy so much tragedy and trying to twist it into making happily ever after is it's it, you know we're gonna have to stray a lot and I feel like you have done a really great job like you did an amazing job with Neon Gods at of making it your own and still keeping the vibe there and I feel like that's enough for it to kind of fall under that retelling but then still making it something new like if, you know when we read these books that have these tropes like we know what's going to happen we know the fake dating trope what's certain things are going to pop up we know that and you know it kind of becomes repetitive in the sense of like you know what's going to happen but then you know with these different types of retellings it's really not what you expect. And that's literally the best part because it keeps you engaged into these stories. Like with your villains um, stories, like they were all done in such interesting ways that so many people have fallen in love with. Like our friend Pauline at, at the books I've loved, she's like in love with uh, Desperate Measures. So she read it I remember on a road trip with her boyfriend right there next to her and she would send like Instagram stories of her going like oh my gosh this is so much better than I thought it could ever be and I feel like you've done an amazing job with your retellings of, of making them your own and keeping people who used to love these original stories love these new characters in a completely different way and I thought that that was we love it I <laughs> Well, and I think you kind of like nailed the whole, it's like, I love the original fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Like if I had ever, like if I wasn't a college dropout and had gone on to be a history major, like I had sort of planned at one point, it would have been in fairy tales because like the way that they adapt and change reflects who's telling them. And mm -hmm. that's like, it's kind of, even though they're written, it's still like that oral tradition element that like I geek out over. And that's why I will never turn down a Beauty and the Beast retelling because even though I know exactly what's going to happen, it's like, how is this author going to put their spin on it? How is yeah. this author going to like put their lens on this story that feels so familiar to me? And so that I think is why like the villains and neon gods do so well is because they're, the stories are not new. They're familiar mm -hmm. and they feel comfortable and safe. And yet it's like me pushing boundaries in different ways within those parameters Right. And so you're getting that payoff of like, yes, this is familiar. I enjoy this. I recognize this while being like, oh, Hades does what now? <laughs> like, and so it's, it's a little bit of like the new with the old. And like, I try to balance that, but I mean, I can't pretend it's intentional. Like it's very instinctual of like, like I like this and I like this. So let's mash it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I know I, I already plan it. Um, November 1st is when you're doing your Kickstarter, I think, for your uh, Wicked Villains series. I, I'm saving up money for it. I am ready to buy the books plus the swag bags. I... I love that like authors now are listening and you're kind of getting these like special editions of copies and stuff. And it's like, I, I, I will admit, I haven't wet read the wicked villains. I have been meaning to, I have, I have so many books I have to read, but I was like, <laughs> if I get these in hardcover, I will have to read them. Like I want to read them. I have been eyeing them. I, I made like a spicy ladder. I worked at Barnes and Noble. And so I made like a spicy ladder. So I had desperate measures on there and I'm always like, Oh yes, you should buy this. If you're looking for like a really, I, I've sold like 60 copies of desperate measures over the summer. Like I sold an, like wow. I sold an incredible amount of neon gods and desperate measures like it's oh, yeah. crazy how how well you did this summer in our in our shop alone which is like definitely like it's in kansas it's 
older white community and then i'm like i'm like i'm pushing romance to all of these people and stuff and uh, when i tell you when i heard you were doing a special like editions like hardcovers for these books i was like i'm sold just just tell me when and where and how much i'm sold here you go take my money (laughs) and i'm happy because again it's so self-indulgent like i my favorite thing in the entire world is like these like book boxes that do these special editions and like you know I've never just been I've never been included and that's okay like because you know they can only do so many I was like what if I just did it myself Mm -hmm. like what if I had control and I and you know as with the monster thing like that's kind of got me thinking of like what if I did old school clinch covers with my villains couple or triple slash couples and so and then in the process of that the book box came about because when I'm stressed I create more work for myself and and then now it's going to be a Kickstarter just because some people are like, well, I don't want to buy all these books again. I just want the art or I just want the swag or like whatever, or just the books. And so it's an easier way for me to gauge like the interest, but I've seen this, my artist is actively working on it and she's working on desperate measures right now. And the cover is going to have a chase lounge on it. And like, I'm so excited. Like she it's just she's very like do you, do you want this to be accurate or do you want this to be like dramatic and overblown I'm like dramatic overblown like yes and so um yeah it's I'm really excited like she's done nail like the thumbnails for like options for all six covers and like she's just nailed it I'm so excited yeah it's so it's, it's I love like Grace and I um we love to spend our money like I've I've gotten I she I I have like th- two editions of the from blood and ash special editions I got the plated prisoner series special editions from the bookish box I even I got like the kingdom of the cursed uh curse cur- cursed the not tea <laughs> um but like I love like special editions are like it makes like you know you're a reader when you get excited about like a special edition that an author is bringing out like gianna darling just came out with hard covers of her fallen men series with the women on the covers those covers are so gorgeous those so covers gorgeous. okay because like the, the that series i had seen it all over tiktok for so much time and i'm just like uh so many you know you guys are making me want to read this book but every time i look at the cover i'm kind of like maybe it's too much for me maybe it's you know it's that's why i read it before grace vibes. reads it that's why i read it before <laughs> and, um, grace reads it <laughs> i'm kind I of mean, like, the brain like, is really good because it gives you pause to be like is this something i want to grab a hold of like she's yeah. she's nails at right. writing yeah and then you know now i'm starting to get into like i wish my romances had a little more you know grit a little more danger and so then i saw her special editions and i'm like those women are gorgeous those covers are I I need them I have to have them and I love when they do the males on one of their covers and then they do the other side of the love interests on the other one I thought that that was like the most cutest thing ever Mm -hmm. I love when books do that they do one side and then they do the other side it's those covers I love them yeah I mean I know I'm gonna send up end up spending more money as a result but like the fact that now like amazon and um ingram spark and stuff like as an indie author we can do hardcover with different covers yeah. and stuff and like i think we're gonna see more of them and i'm really excited because it's yeah. just like it's it's so so cool especially when the author really has like is keyed in the way that she is on mm-hmm. those and it's just like she yeah. knew exactly what we wanted and she gave it to us yeah she, and it's, she knew the assignment yeah and it's like a romance always is like romance hasn't really been i mean you have like nora roberts and jared Ward, kind of those like really big romance names where they do come out with like hard covers of their books when they're first released but a lot of like the rom-coms and stuff are like come out as paperback and like everybody's like oh you must love paperback books and i'm like no it's just a lot of romance comes out in paperback and it's like would i love hardcover editions of course like don't get me wrong like to have i'm like so i cannot spend money on this like i'm a college student i have to pay like all my bills and stuff like i cannot buy a six book hardcover series i cannot will i probably Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like yeah my it's on my bucket list to have like 
the Dark Olympus special, some kind of special oh, edition in a box gosh. somewhere, which I'm like, I told my publicist and she's like, we will pitch it. So, you know, keep your fingers crossed. Maybe at some point, Fairy it'll Loot, happen. Wanna, Fairy Loot, you want to help us out and like right. um, Dark Call me. <laughs> like that's that's us reaching out to to dana from dana. the bookish box i'm like hey dana yeah. hi friend hi. it's been you wanna, a while you wanna help us out <laughs> no we love <laughs> the bookish box and fairy loot here and their special yeah. editions especially for like the new ones coming out and stuff it's like holy cow like the amount of like artists who do fan art is like one of my favorite things because it's like oh how are you so good like why <laughs> they're wizards they're absolute i just because i just added like i have a patron or whatever and i just added like a not safe for work art tier to it because i was like i cannot tell you how many patreon patreons i have signed up for just to get the dirty art because i love it like it makes me happy so, and it's like yeah. how i don't understand how it works like how they just like do a thing and then it's beautiful but they voted on a scene from the beast to be like for like this art thing and the lady like did it and it i'm like you are a wizard <laughs> like i don't i don't understand when i draw like you're like maybe that's a dinosaur i don't know like it's, <laughs> and so the fact that it looks like so real and just oh my gosh i yeah so any chance for me to like book artists i'm like hello i would love to book smart with you like uh so do it a lot now honestly the the fan art that we have been getting these past few months of like the romance and like the smutty books are like amazing because like before you would rarely ever get any fan art for anything other than like you know fantasy or YA fantasy things like that but now we're starting to get you know now like this wave of readers jumping from new adult to adult from YA is you know tidal wave of people right and the fan arts are coming in with them you know and so we're getting a lot of you know not suitable for work art and (laughs) it's just so good it's so good it's it's funny because you have have to (laughs) we have a group chat oh my god instagram and it's literally me grace amen and then our mutual friend melissa um, and we have it's a not safe for work and so we said like any bookish stuff in there but like it's like where we said like our like raunchy like not safe for work like oh. the ones that instagram allows to keep up yes. because if you want the really good ones you gotta head Go over to twitter. twitter for that oh yeah twitter is only- like <laughs> twitter's no rules they just just vibes like it's, oh. that's where i find all my artists for the most part is because they like to retweet each other and so now i follow so many artists over there that i have this giant list compiled of like i'm gonna work through all of you eventually because yes it's just it's the ice planet it's, barbarian it's fan there. art the not safe for work ice planet barbarian fan art i think there's one so there's one happy. girl who blew up on tiktok and she makes like prints now she has stickers she has mm-hmm. bookmarks it's like i forgot who it was but like she blew up on tiktok from like her ice planet barbarian um fan art and it was like the barb and it was just oh like I want to support it so bad and like buy every single one of their pieces so uh Katie do you have a favorite fan artist in your lineup I oh I don't know if I could pick favorites but um (laughs) maybe your top five that you'll always go to I well I'm still working with some new folks and I I actually can't list them off the top of my head because they're all new and I'm terrible with names but I found this person on Twitter that I was because I I I got a little over enthused and like booked out through um Wicked Beauty and so I was like I want like Helen Achilles patrol class like I want like the threesome like do it and they sent me because they send like pre-sketches and they sent me sketches of two different positions and I was like both and the and then like then they put like body hair on the dudes which i you don't see that often and i was like oh yeah i was like look at that man's chunky thighs like you thank you yes and so um yeah so they are really awesome the um mer mammal i think is her screen yep, name on the, instagram yeah, yeah that's the I yeah. barbarians okay she did a not safe for work piece of art of my monster just because i was like you know, self-indulgent. Um, well, I'll get there eventually and share it. Like, <laughs> and it's, 
she's like I've never done like the full on like whatever and I was like well you did a good job so I'm very excited to eventually share that uh she was great (laughs) it's very that like I'm so glad that I'm your first then I know I was like I will be circling back for more so I hope you're okay with tentacles (laughs) (laughs) so Um, uh kind of getting into that like not safe for work um when writing sexy scenes do you ever feel like oh I've written this before and like how do you continue to write like those sexy scenes yet make them feel completely independent of each other so this kind of comes back to being a character writer in that like the sex scenes usually tell me so much about the characters and so they end up being really unique even if you're going through like you know there's only so many positions and so many like actions that you can do but when you're with because of the characters involved and because of the dynamics between them that's what makes it feel really unique and usually if I'm getting bored or feeling like it's stale, it means I've done something wrong or I haven't like clicked in the way I need to be to like their thing, mm-hmm. um, which happens from time to time. You know, it's not a, a, I misstep all the time, but it's, it's usually those are the scenes that are actually the easiest for me because it's like, oh, I get to like bury your soul or like dig into this kink or like whatever. And, um, and then, you know, I'm usually like scandalizing myself and that's my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> that's Awesome. And, and like, so what do you think kind of makes a, for a good like recipe for like those really like emotional scenes or like those really good spicy scenes? Well, it's like, so, and this is something like just author wise that people, mm-hmm. if you like, cause it's a lot of components and a lot of moving parts, like both emotionally and physically. So it is super helpful if it's a new thing for you to sketch it out the physical parts and then go through and filter in the senses and the emotions and stuff because it's like the physical stuff is like the stuff that you're like oh yay but like that's not what makes the sex scene memorable it's the emotional bits and the like the verbal back and forth or like what have you and it's yeah it's it's just uh like I if somebody is being vulnerable or like not admitting to themselves that they're being vulnerable or like though that really can like move the plot and the relationship and the character growth like forward like massively and so yeah it's but I I like I just kind of do it instinctually (laughs) at this point because you know I've written like a gajillion books so it's it's not I I don't have to think about it as Mm -hmm. much anymore that it's like okay like I know where approximately the beats will be within the sex scene and so like that's what we're working towards but then half the time we take a hard right turn and end up in you know somewhere else that I was like oh okay all right like mm-hmm. and like sometimes I know going in like I knew going into like Wicked Beauty for example that Helen and Achilles are gonna have a contentious relationship that will result in hate sex like fighting to boning like I knew that was going to happen and and then but figuring out the dynamic with patrol class involved and like how the relationships in and so that was really interesting like to navigate those sex scenes with the three of them because it did not go like I expected and it, so it was really fun because so I was like oh you yeah. surprised me that's exciting <laughs> that's so good to like hear that like the em- emotional part really like has a huge impact on like how the scene is developed and how it kind of plays out because like you know we yes we love we love smutty scenes and we love spicy spicy books and all these things and we want books with multiple scenes and all of these things but then you get books that are are just that and that's it and it's just like for me personally like yeah could I read a book like that yeah it, will I enjoy it mm, you know you never it, but it depends on how the author pulls it off though yeah. because like I thought that that was something I didn't want to write and my taboo books are just that it's like 90 yeah. percent sex but because of the way I mean it's also the promise of the book but right. like but some of the ones I've read that I'm like oh I don't know if I want just sex but then I read it and I'm like oh yeah I didn't know that I wanted this thank you for providing it for me yeah. so it's it's like it's, it's but you can but if they're just recycling yes, and it's the emotional it. beats have to continue to grow and change mm-hmm. otherwise it is just recycling and then that's stale yeah Christina because Lauren, like you they do really well with that Christina Lauren, their yeah. beautiful bastard you want... series is yeah, you... that's spicy. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely want their like yes, if we're getting that all throughout the book, fine. But that 
different place mentally is very like there at every scene like you want that growth you want that development because like even though this is like a smutty book like yeah we're gonna have those scenes often but that development that character development also has to be part of there because it's part of a book it's a book you know we want to start at some place and then we want to finish somewhere else you know and certain books that I have read um, who have like these super super spicy scenes yes the spicy scenes are good but then the book kind of like fades away for me as opposed to other books that have that emotional depth and those senses of like vulnerability and that kind of growth throughout their books and maybe have like a couple scenes those kind of hold more impact to me because those moments were so important to how both characters were feeling and it just like makes you feel like wow this is so good this I've been waiting for this release and it's there you know and it kind of shows between like you know an author who knows kind of what they're doing and one who's still figuring it out and I love seeing that change in authors who you read their very very early on books and then to what they're writing right now that growth as a writer is like chef's kiss as well because what you can get better I love to like with when you so I recently I I don't binge authors that often like because I I have the attention span of a squirrel like it's it's like two books and if that's it and then I wander off and I'll circle back usually but like but earlier this year I devoured I think all but two of Kate C. Wells's books. And she writes, I, it started with this mafia romance run, Posey run, and that the hero is a legitimate sociopath. And I don't say that as like, oh, he's a sociopath to he, because like, that's kind of problematic. But he's like, literally, like they have communication issues because he does not understand the emotional like flag yeah. she's sending up. And it was handled in such a fascinating way. And her voice was so interesting that I end up like devouring all her books. Mm-hmm. But you can see, like, when you read an author's backlist, the hints of where they were going to end up early on. Like, you can see those things, those those themes or those character types or whatever start to show up. And that feels like magic to be like, oh, I saw that you were talking about this over here six books ago. And now it's at fruition here where you really yeah. pulled off this concept. And, um, like, I saw that with Sierra Simone a little bit with uh, – misadventures of a professor or whatever that one the misadventures one with the professor like student yeah um not really student but in her thorn chapel series that heroine from the professor book was like the walk so that the thorn chapel series could run like that themes like she really delved in and it's just like if i don't know it feels like getting like a peek behind the curtain when you see that yeah uh do you have like um some of like your favorite spicy authors yes so sierra <laughs> simone of course yeah like she just she she just I have the priest <laughs> series right here <laughs> i'm so excited yeah. to read it um and i really like i haven't read her books in a while because but i was like deeply obsessed with tiffany rice um oh, the original cool. sinners they're not technically romance i mean they they the series ends in a happy relationship with the main characters and like whatever but like she calls them more like erotic thrillers which mm-hmm. is why she gets away with some of the content in there that like would not work in a romance but because of the way they're branded it works right. but she like and i don't know why all my books have like people that deal with priests <laughs> but but her her like the way that she deals with kink and stuff was like so sexy that i'm like also a good barometer for me of like did I go too far no okay um (laughs) and Nikki Sloan also is writes pretty spicy and Rebecca Weatherspoon specifically not all of her books aren't like because the spice level ranges a little bit like the beards and bondage series is like where I go where I want to like feel all the things all the things um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and get like hot and flustered and also like a little angsty at the same time like it's like trauma bonding like and if I pitch these books to you and I'm like well she was running from the woods from a serial killer and like he shot him dead like it sounds like horrific but like they feel like wrapping yourself up in a sexy blanket sounds and just good. cuddling by a fire that like, sounds good <laughs> oh read the beards and bondage series by Rebecca Weatherspoon it is so so good and they're all like bonkers like that and then like super kinky 
and like really great consent good communication but just sexy as shit we love that yeah so she good. i'm waiting for tiktok to find her stuff because i'm like listen like we the the diversity is getting better but like it's still a lot of like straight white stuff and like i'm like there's so much out there like let me just take it take it she has a giant backlist it's very queer like yeah read her books they're great (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome and like so these are like your favorite spicy authors but um does your kind of like authors who inspire you and like differ from that list do you have others who like just like really touch you so I have probably my top three authors and just that and ironically none of them write romance but um Alona Andrews which is like a husband wife couple but like they're the way that they tell stories and like how deep they get into Mm -hmm. these stories while still being action-packed and like the magic it's just it's so intense and I could never write like that and I love I just it doesn't matter what they write I'm like yes I'll buy this from you um I really love Ann Bishop Mm the black jewels trilogy imprinted on me so hard that i basically married lucifer like <laughs> she just doesn't have wings but like that is that is my husband uh <laughs> content warnings galore in those books but, but like the way that she deals with the trauma that mm. the heroine goes through feels really like i didn't recognize that as a teenager that that was like so authentic but like as an adult i'm like yeah no yeah good job yeah. and then jacqueline carey is Again, something that uh, an author that I am waiting for TikTok to find because she writes these epic political fantasies that are also kinky as shit, like very, very hot. And um, I'm just waiting because I'm like, TikTok, I know you'll love this, like the Kushiel's Dart series because the heroine is like a spy slash courtesan who feels pleasure as, or feels pain as pleasure. And, and the hero is a priest who has taken a ch- vow of chastity, who is her bodyguard. Like, like, and the, the villain of that series is like, uh, I don't know why I didn't realize that I was queer reading that series. Cause it's like, I love you so much, step on me. Like, it's just, it, it's just, it's so, so good. I'm gonna have to get my okay. hands on that. Hmm. Okay. Grace and I are like, mm. <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> Like you're you're describing these books and you're just like I don't want to scare you but like and we're just like whoa that sounds pretty good. Well, I just try to like like <laughs> do the flags so that like people yeah. know what they're getting into. Like because like she, there's not you know it's it's an it's a fantasy a, a dark ish fantasy so there is stuff that you're just like oh that seems problematic but like uh, it's just so good it's so good and their relationship is because it's really hard to have a like especially over like epic fantasy levels to have a relationship actually proceed in a way that feels super organic and it doesn't feel like she's throwing up like you know plot twists to like keep them apart it's like they are diametrically opposed in like their values and even though they fall in love that those values still differ and like she doesn't stop being a courtesan because he's like a gentle like sweet baby angel who like can't hurt her and so, you know, she still has to like have that need met elsewhere at times. And it's just like, and then it, so it, the way that the relationship progresses is just so beautiful. And so like, uh, it's just, those books are just perfection. I mean, I don't know if they're actually perfection or if I just feel like they are, cause I read them at an informative, <laughs> formative age, but they just, I reread them every once in a while, like uh, every like year or two, just cause they're so good. So I can tell you have a love. You're a very character focused person. I can tell that. So yes. Yes. when <laughs> thinking of personalities for your characters, what techniques do you use for like writing their actions and kind of like, how do you like, how, what's your process of trying to determine like, oh, they would say this, or this is what they would do for each of your characters. Like, do you plan that out or you kind of just go by the flow of it? I go by the flow I used to like if I get stuck I will um this author um I took I don't know this thing that was like here like I don't do character uh personality tests or anything like I usually know their sign like their astrology sign and then I usually if I get stuck we'll be like well how do they react to anger how do they react to compliments how do they react to like frustrations how does this work? like so I have like those gut checks but 
usually by the time I'm like, I, it's very, um, ex like I'm exploring as I'm writing. And so yeah. like, I'll have like a, you know, Hades is the grumpy closed up one. And Persephone is the sunshine that really covers up the feral one. And so like, I know those core components of them and that really informs the interactions and stuff. Mm -hmm. but sometimes you know I'm like well this isn't working like Patroclus gave me kittens I was like I don't understand you like you are not what I thought you were going to be and like I had to like do a little more digging with that character than I have with like a lot just because he's not I was like how do you plug in here like (laughs) um but but usually it's really instinctual just because I like I said I've done this so much that I can and I, I usually spend quite some time thinking about it even while I'm working on other stuff so by the time I get there I'm like oh yeah like I'm familiar with these people like let's do the thing yeah that's That's... it's it's funny because like Maggie and I very early on last year we decided that we were going to write a book this year this year we've we've known each other for a year only we've only known each other for a year this this it's year it's only been a year it's only been a year oh, it's moved right. strangely in pandemic times <laughs> yeah. yeah time does not exist here it's it's very we're in the quantum construct. realm and so <laughs> so we decided that we were going to write a book together and um had kind of like a basis of what we wanted to do and then we found ourselves doing so many outlines of characters and just who they were and we're just like oh this person does this and this and then you know we can do this with this story and what if they have a scene like this and then by the end of like our third meeting we had plotted out that this was going to be a three book series that we were going to have certain couples kind of sketched out and where they would be is the actual story plot ish written? No, but chapter these characters one, were one chapter. <laughs> We've had one these chapter for six were months. So real, yeah. It's so funny and funny because, like, um, at one point when we were like really heavy into like all the planning and all these things, these characters felt so real to us. Like, I would sometimes imagine them like walking into my room and how they would strut and how they would sit down or look at my bookshelf and I'm like "Um, sir excuse me this is not your space here what are you doing here and it's just kind of like that thing of like when a a character that you create becomes like kind of becomes like its own person it's just like it's they're doing what they want to do what you have planned is not what they they see that and they're just like a, a child and they're just like no mom i i don't want to do that I'm, I'm i'm gonna go over here i'm gonna do this it's like but but i made you <laughs> you're it's so it's really interesting i love so this 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 is gonna sound like i'm pitching them i'm, I'm not paid by these people but like i'm a big fan uh so becca syme is an author who does she works with the Gallup Strengths Finder, like she's like a coach or whatever the shit. And but she applies that to like writers and like how your personality aspects and your strengths inform like your process and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it's really interesting to hear like like I don't plot at all because mm-hmm. if I plot, then that what happens is what happens with you is it's like well I told the story it's right there like I don't need to tell it again like it's it's done. And so but like and but that also allows for the freedom of that character to be like "Mm -hmm, no I'm gonna do this and then you find out like oh they definitely would have done this and it's like it plays out in a way that like when people read it they're like oh wow that was so smart how you did that and I'm like (laughs) it was definitely intentional and not at all an accident totally meant to do that it's it's very but it's just like your subconscious is very smart like that yeah yeah it's very funny that you mentioned the Gallup strengths test because we took that on campus um, mm-hmm. Gallup has a location uh, uh, they have their headquarters is here um, where I live and so with our university they have like the freshmen come in and they so I took it a couple of years ago but my like top trait was futuristic and so that definitely plays out with like I loved like I have to plan out a book and I'm like okay I have to have an outline of like what I want to do and like like I'm yes Grace and I are writing but I've kind of also spun off into my own like independent like author and I have like a bookstore like series of like booksellers 
based off of my life because I was a Barnes and Noble bookseller and I'm like dude I have so many stories I could tell you this is perfect for a book <laughs> um but like it's like I, I it's funny to like hear all of these like authors and other people talk about like their planning process because it's like you either like you plot or some people they just will go and just write and they're like I can do it like this I don't even need like it's all filed away in my brain my brain and stuff and I'm like how I wish I could do that just give me give me that power <laughs> Well, and that right there is why when people are like, this is the proper way to do it. I'm like, yeah. you are a liar because yeah. that might be your way and that's perfectly fine, but that is not my way. Yeah. And like that, that test gave me the freedom to be like, oh, I need to stop plotting. Like, like I had the coaching session with Becca and she's like, you need to stop plotting. You're wasting time. Cause I'm number one activator, number two strategic. And so strategic like figures out the way through, like mm-hmm. as I'm going and I've already thought of 12 different better options than I had thought of when I tried to plot the book which is frustrating with traditional because they actually require you to like send them a synopsis of like Mm. what happens in the book and it's like mine start out super detailed and so like the first like 25 percent of the book is like an entire page and the last like 75 percent is like three paragraphs because it's like well listen here's the main beats that'll happen it's we're going to get there eventually don't ask questions you don't need to know trust the process it'll get there the train will get to that station well, that's a privilege of being a mm-hmm. experienced author is that I am like, look at all these books I've written. We always get there. It doesn't always look the same, but we get there. Whereas newbie authors can bump up against that and feel like the pressure of like, well, I wrote this mm-hmm. in the synopsis, so it has to happen, even though I feel like it needs to be a better way. It's like, nah, it doesn't. It doesn't. If they tell you that they're lying, like as long as you have the main promise of the book is the same that you like pitched it on or sold it on, that's all they need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So kind of going into that, um, for new authors, what would you say is like, if you could kind of go back to like, when you were first starting off as an author, what advice would you give yourself as a first time author trying to get published? (laughs) I have a few. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The first would be to figure out what, what your metrics of success are. And preferably have those metrics be things that you can control. Not like, I'm going to hit the New York Times list. Like you can't control that. You, you can build towards it and you can like pave the way as much as possible. But ultimately that goalpost is not within your control, which can set you up for like a career of misery and frustration. Mm. So like having whatever your metrics are, whatever they look like for you, setting those up ahead of time, because that will also inform your decisions on like, Do you go independent publishing? Do you try to get an agent and go traditional? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? Because there's no right way to publish, but there are wrong ways if you're trying to do certain things, if that makes sense. And and the other thing is that if a small publisher tells you that it's like a family or like whatever, I just don't sign contracts without an agent. I don't care if it's for like a tiny little publisher that feels super friendly or if it's for, you know, like one of the big five or six or however many there are now sorry (laughs) don't know what's happening um like because because publishers are out their businesses and they're protecting their business interests and uh i have no idea what's going on i'm so sorry if you that's messing it up um and so they're not going to like they're not going to protect you and at the second that you stop performing they will sever business interests because it's a business right and so yeah so having an agent who will like look out for your interests is super valuable because um <laughs> because you know then you're protected so are you right. sure you're not getting attacked right now <laughs> so it's like i don't, don't know <laughs> i'm like are you hammering like are we doing construction i don't I was not notified of this. <laughs> right. I was like, it's quiet time, people. <laughs> yeah. So kind of a question. Do you, well, you've obviously done both indie and um, traditional publishing. And like, there's like, both are valid, but is there one that you prefer more? Is it like, or is it kind of, it depends on the story and depending on what you want out of this, out of the book series? Yeah, it definitely pre- Okay. It definitely pre- depends on like what you want out of like traditional serves its purpose and it can be, and it's like, I will never go for fully traditional again because I like how fast I can move with India. I like having all the control. I, but it can be really overwhelming 
when you're first getting in there like your first book's the worst after that you're like I've done this before you know I know the steps it's fine but like it's a lot of information even if you're do, do, doing your due diligence and like researching it there's a lot of it it's like trying to drink from a fire hose and so that can be really overwhelming and like some people just don't want to deal with it and that's totally a fair call to make it's just sort of like it's just again it comes back to priorities like what what are your goals what are your priorities like do you want to be able to tell the story that you want without having to worry about being like widely commercial because in indie you can niche down as we've seen on tiktok Mm -hmm. you can niche down and there are readers that want you know the alien mafia abduction romance or like whatever like there are people who want to read that and want to read 500 of those books and so you can make a ton of money but it's not widely commercial so traditional is like we're not nobody wants that Mm -hmm. it's like no they do you just you can't find them I can find them yeah um but the trade-off is the responsibility and the work and you have to do everything which is Mm -hmm. you know is a lot especially if you have a full-time job yeah well yeah, because uh, we interviewed um, Anna Huang, who is the author mm-hmm. of Twisted Love and Twisted Games, and she has a full-time job, and she's doing it, and, like, I know that book series is so good, so I'm so excited for a full-time for job? She yeah. has a full-time job. Where yeah. does she find the time? Exactly. Literally. Exactly. Literally. Wow. <laughs> like, well done. Like, <laughs> man, we're yeah. talking, like... When we had her on, we were, like, talking about all these things. First of all, she's so, like, quiet and demure. And then, like, some of her scenes are just, like, Miss Anna. <laughs> See, everybody, when Twisted, what's the first one? Twisted Games? Twisted Love. Love. Twisted Love. Love. When Twisted Love came out, everybody was, like, oh, brother's best friend. And, like, that's not my trope. So I was, like, okay, like, whatever. But then I picked it up because a friend of mine read it and loved it. And I was, like, okay, like, there's more going on here. I started reading. I'm, like, it's a morality chain why didn't you not tell me that it's more he's like he's a scary scary man like I love this shit <laughs> he gave me like mafia CEO vibes and I was like oh my goodness this is that phone call scene I was like God. yeah when people are like oh it's not spicy I'm like listen there's not like 500 spicy scenes but the spice is like the spice is good. It's the what tension. we have is it's good. It's the tension and that brings yeah. the spice together. It's when, the build up. When like the leaning into like the stuff, like he put her panties in her mouth. Like that, that is spice. I don't care if it's only one scene oh, or yeah. like five scenes or however many scenes, like the spice level in those scenes was superb. Yes, yeah. it was so good. And then the second one, oh my god. I haven't read it yet. I'm saving it for like like hoarding it. Oh, oh my so gosh. Bad. When you like your your book edging it that, that that's a term I just found out what what it was and for those who don't know it's when you know you really want to read a book but you're putting it off for as long as possible so that you can literally meet with know, every single book enjoy it <laughs> yeah me with every single I, book I'm ICBR. notorious for not reading the last book in trilogies because of that because I'm like but then it'll be over and then I can only read it for the first time once and I just never read it which oh, is a yeah. problem <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, I will say so far Twisted Games is my favorite of the two, but I have a feeling that the fourth book is going to be my favorite just because of the couple. Yeah. Is it? So I saw a promo that she put out and I was like, what? so that one, <laughs> that one, that one is Twisted for Hate. the next book Twisted okay. Hate oh and that one is Stella's book because this book is the girls as the friend group that each uh-huh. book is on the different friend group of the girls which I love because usually we get the guys yeah and the brothers and things like that but I love hers because it's the girls and I gotta say I love I love each of the girls in their own but we already knew that the brother was going to be a good one just because his vibe was something different. Even though we only got him like for a page in the first book, yeah. Josh was, yeah. I was yeah. like, you're going to be something special. And that little teaser she put out, I was like, whoa, whoa, I am not prepared. Her Facebook group you. chat. I'm not Facebook prepared, group. but I'm also like really ready. Yeah. Really I ready. I'm in her Facebook group. Grace and I are, so we we get yeah. a little bit of the scenes, and I I will sometimes just pop in there, and I'm like, oh, 
this I'm, I'm like i know who i know what anna like sounds like i know how she talks and stuff and i'm like i'm like this innocent woman is like making me like blush so hard like how oh yeah it's so funny i love her tiktoks she'll do like this tiktok of like um when she's writing and then she's just like when you're reading i think it was like she was like um, when you're reading back certain scenes and then you're realizing that this is like your resting oh, yeah. position and i, was, like, I saw that one <laughs> Miss I'm like Anna. on brand. <laughs> yes, because um, all her well, men seem to like that resting position as well. If you love the bodyguard, I'm trope, here for it. The bodyguard trope of like, oh yeah, that's the second book, and it's like, oh, so good. well, and like I keep, I saw so her do so many TikToks about the throne scene. I'm like, listen, I'm I'm like prepared. I just haven't been like prepared, and so. Maybe that'll be my next read. So I good. like I'm I'm in an awful book hangover right now. So I'm like I I hesitating to read books that I know I'll like because I'm like what if the book hangover like overrides the goodness? Oh like I don't my know. Gosh. What book did I you had hangover? one after Little Thieves by Margaret Owen. It's YA, which is funny because like I've read I think four YA books this year and they're all on my top list. But it's it's not out yet. It's coming out I think next month. And it's yeah. like a morally gray heroine who's like up to some thievery and like light identity theft and just like at one point I was like I'm really enjoying it like I like the world building because she's like a goddaughter of like death and fortune and like I'm reading it and like yeah I'm loving it and then the hero like is very smart and like is like I know what you're doing and here's all the things and like I figured you out and she like slack puts shackles on him and like lets him get tossed into a river and she's like yeah he'll figure out how to swim or maybe he won't like whatever anyways and I was like I love you <laughs> and it's just it just gets better from there it's it was so good like it was oh, good, like good. in like heisty elements like oh yeah yeah I love it. those kind of like books that have like you know they may be fantasy or they may be like contemporary or like urban or whatever but they have like these like little scenes that just like they're just like did that really just happen I'm so here for this and those books are just like the best because like you're so surprised by them and then in the end, they were just like, oh, that scene was just everything to me. That I love that. Well, it's so, I mean, it's not as rare as it used to be, but it's still not like overly common to have a heroine that's mm-hmm. so morally great that she's like, yeah, a little murder, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. and not even just, but it's not like I want to murder, like vengeful. It's just mm-hmm. like, yeah, that he's a, you know, unfortunate side effect. Yeah. Bye. Like, and just the way that she was very understandably self-serving but like super morally gray of like this serves me or that doesn't is like was my favorite thing because it never stopped like yeah. she never like saw the light of day and was like I'm gonna be a good person now she's like well the world's gonna kick me in the teeth the first chance it gets like why why do I have to sacrifice myself and be virtuous when yeah. it's only gonna mean that I suffer like that's not what I want mm-hmm. and it's just oh it's it was it was really good I highly recommend yeah <laughs> I like that because like before we used to get that guy all the time Mm -hmm. and now the girls they're a little bit smarter and they're a little more you know conniving and a little slick and we love that we love the little the little slytherin kind of going through the chokehold on like we don't like unlikable heroines is loosening which I appreciate because like they're my favorite I'm like like they're so fun in the Kate C. Wells series there's the because like so I don't read MC romance it's not just because it's like a crap shoot like you might get like good stuff or you might get something like so traumatic that I don't want to deal with and so I was like I don't know about like I liked your mom but I don't know about MC romance and like a friend was like no no just just go for it and it's amazing of course but the heroine or sorry the the club leader dude his sister is like she's a bitch like she's mean as a rattlesnake she's very vindictive she's super smart and slick and like just vicious and I'm like when do we get her book <laughs> like, I, I know she's awful but like I want her book because like I feel like she's got reasons and that's all I need is like <laughs> some reasons mm-hmm. we see the potential here you put it there for us now just give us when We'll yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to harass her because I'm like, listen, like, I know that you probably like, I don't like, I love it when people are like, when's this book coming? Cause it's like, I'm happy you're excited. Cause I'm excited. But like, as a reader, I don't want to be like, excuse me, <laughs> listen, I don't want to put pressure on you, but also like times a tick and when do I get this book? Oh yeah, that's definitely the feeling and having to rein that like feeling in 
it's sometimes so hard, but you do have to remember authors do have lives and they do have other works that they're doing. And they just like, yeah, you're right. I got to rein it in. I guess you can have hobbies, whatever. (laughs) I guess you can have dinner with your family every other night and not write. It's fine. It's fine. (laughs) I'll survive. Well, I think this is a natural ending point. We have been going on for a while now. I, we, we were, I was kind of nervous because I was like, I don't want to talk. I don't want to like force her to like listen to us talk for like two or three hours. Cause we, we will we'll sometimes do that. Well, like a lot of times we'll have before the podcast uh, for listeners who have been listening for a while. We'll talk about how we've been talking to like a guest for like an hour before we even start the podcast. Sometimes we love talking and we just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on to the podcast because I don't know about a, a grace, but like I was so shocked. I was like so excited. I was trembling. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. I was like, I didn't do anything today because I was so nervous. I was like, I can't get anything done. I like an Excel project due for like accounting. And I was like, I'm spending two hours on this and then I'm doing nothing else for the rest of the day. I'm not reading. I'm not doing anything until after I like got ready. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. So thank you so much for coming on. It really was such a great pleasure for you to be our first guest of our October event. It just... We're so excited to have you. Yes, Thank you are. so much for inviting me. This was so much fun. <laughs> yes. Um, before we go, uh, we do want to give a couple of announcements to our listeners. Um, for this uh, October event, we will have some stickers going up for our authors. So we will have a sticker pack featuring all of our authors in one sticker and then each author getting their own sticker. So you will get a total of six stickers in this pack. And it is an exclusive for this event that we're doing this whole month. So you will get a couple nods to our author's biggest books and a couple of little inside readers, if you know their books and what kind of things pop out. Um, It will be going up in mid-October. So you will start seeing little snippets here and there on our Instagram stories and our shop Instagram as well. And just be ready on the lookout for that. Uh, Maggie, do you have? Um, We will have links to everything for Katie down below. We will definitely have her uh, Patreon and her Kickstarter links. Mm -hmm. So if you want to join, I definitely know I'm going to join that not safe for work. You convinced me. Maybe Grace and I will like join together and we can can just simp over all your characters. But um, thank you again, Katie, so much for coming on. And thank you everybody who listened to this podcast. If you are new here, um, we will be having more authors on. Um, Our next guest is going to be Nisha, um, Nisha Sharma from, yes, yes, um, we're actually going to talk to her on Thursday, it's Saturday, Sunday night, so we're talking to her on Thursday, and she is going to be next week's guest, because this goes out on Friday, so we are so excited, so stay tuned for that episode, we'll be coming out in next week, and that is our second guest, and then you'll get the third guest in that episode, but we are so excited, you can also check out our Instagram You can see where all the guests are on there. Um, But yes, thank you so much to Katie and everybody for being here with us today. And we will see you next week. Have a good rest of your evening. Bye. Bye, everybody.